Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Yes, welcome to Asia Tech Podcast number 12, where we talk about the biggest trends right now in the Asian tech ecosystem. Today, we're looking at the $100 billion health tech and medical tourism market featuring Southeast Asia, Japan, and China. But first, let's kick off proceedings with a recap of highlights from Michael's health tech panel session in Bangkok today. Asia Tech Podcast. Voice of the Asian tech ecosystem. ecosystem. How was your event? Yeah, oh, it was awesome. I mean, really, really good. We were we were told that I, I think we just did it at the right time today. We did it just before lunch, so everybody was kind of motivated to listen yeah. really closely and then just leave. Um, and we had a really good panel. So the venture capitalists that were with us were really, really great. I mean, Jeff Chi was just fabulous. And Haley, Haley, yeah, Haley, who was great, really impressive. Like we, the, the three or four of us talked, and Paul McTaggart, obviously, who runs Medical Departures, was really fabulous. I've known Paul for years. I met the other two today, and they're really great people. Jeff is also the um, the chairman of the uh, Venture Capital and Private Equity Association in Singapore. He's an MD at Vickers Venture Partners, so he's he's a big deal. And Haley is an investor at the B Capital Group, and she spent years before she got her MBA at INSEAD doing kind of healthcare mm. consulting for Accenture, I believe. So having her on the panel was great, and she was extremely elegant, eloquent in her speech and very knowledgeable, actually, as well. Um, I will not say that it surprised me in the least. Mm. She got her undergrad degree in economics and something like that at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business. She was great, really, really great. And they all had – the great thing was they didn't agree with each other, but they disagreed nicely. Yeah, yeah. And nobody on the panel knew each other prior really except for me and Paul, and Paul and I didn't sit next to each other. So the whole panel was spread out really nicely. And getting a chance to talk about something that interests all of us. I think the reason why the people in the audience paid attention was because health tech – it's just something that everybody cares about, particularly yeah. in the context of what was going on in the United States over the past couple of weeks with exactly. the healthcare bill, right? the healthcare bill, and all the ACA stuff, and you know the fact that it just impacts everybody's life yeah, yeah, yeah. every day. I mean, if someone in your family gets sick, or if you have a need for insurance or anything like that, which I think everybody does, um, I just thought it was really, really interesting stuff. Hmm. So, and I've been advising. Paul McTaggart for two years. I sit on his actually official advisory committee for the medical departures business, which we disclose every time we talk about stuff like that in public, but it was really good. And we got great participation from the panelists prior to the panel mm -hmm. in the sense that there were things that they specifically wanted to address, which we'll get to as we continue this conversation. But it just meant that the people that were there were the people that participated in the panel. Some of the previous panels, right, like travel tech, even ed tech, which is something that I find really interesting and what you and I have discussed in the past. It's been discussed before. Mm. But from a health tech perspective, at least, I don't think anybody else had really spoken about it at length. And it just made it, at least up until that point, the best part of the day. That's so great. It's yeah. great, isn't it? Getting a panel to work at a conference is the exception <laughs> rather than the rule, isn't it? You, you, I, I like you. I've sat in so many conference panels and they haven't worked. I mean, they've had the right people on the panel and the right subject, but they just haven't sort of gelled or the chemistry wasn't there or the moderation wasn't right or, you know, it was the graveyard shift after lunch. <laughs> right. You kind of definitely don't want to be in the one after lunch no. where everybody's kind of milling around and everyone's yeah. a little bit full and... I haven't yeah. had their coffee yet for the afternoon, but today went well, so that awesome. was good. And I'd like to think that part of it was because the moderation was spectacular. <laughs> yeah. It made such a difference, though. I mean, you know, there's that one style of moderation where somebody goes, what do you think? Okay, then what do you think? And then what do you think? And it's sort of like they do that round, don't they? Round robin of everybody. Right, right. But if you kind of know you where you want to kind of take the narrative and you've had that sort of buy-in a little bit from your panelists as well beforehand, which sounds like you have – you can kind of know where you can kind of take the conversation, which can really help the audience come along with you. Yes. I mean, I was, again, and I repeat this all the time, but I was listening to a podcast last week 
from um, Jason Calacanis, and Jason said that they've asked him to do a show periodically now on CNBC, I believe. Hmm. And they give him about five or ten minutes, and he says it takes him hours to prepare. Right. And it, he said it. Someone once said to him, "You seem like you've prepared just as much as Howard Stern, who was one of the original shock jocks." But Howard was very prepared. Oh yeah, yeah. It always sounded like he was talking off the top of his head. Yeah, but he wasn't. Yeah. And before we sat down on the stage today, I had gone through everybody's dossier online to the extent that I could. So I knew where they were from and what interested them and what in what companies they had invested. And, mm. you know, I, I had questions specifically for individual people so I could move it. And they were great, actually, at creating <laughs> segues. At, right, one right. Point, at one point, I actually, and I, don't, I hope nobody knows, but I actually took my fist, did that kind of little quiet fist pump thing because I wanted to lead into something. And I believe it was Haley who just said, she she just led right into it with right. you know that big data is going to be a really important part of that as well, awesome. something like that. And then I said to Jeff, I'm like, so Jeff, you and I had been talking about big data earlier and all yeah, this other yeah, stuff. Yeah. Anyway, it was really good. Love it. Really, really good. Um, anyway, I wanted to follow up a little bit, if you don't mind, about so on something we spoke about last week, the food delivery. Um, and the reason why is because it dovetails nicely with what we were talking about last week. And yeah. I wanted to do this in the context of the United States. I told you I don't love this business because I think the barriers to entry are really low. And I think the margins are really thin. And I think getting it right is so non-trivial that there's not a lot of room for error. And last week on TechCrunch, a business like this in the United States, and as always, I believe we can see the future by what happens in the United States. Yeah. Because people are trying to mimic and copy what happens there, out here. And Munchery is a business that was built around, you know, basically re what they say, reinventing the weeknight dinner. So you just order either food on demand or they'll bring you food that you prepare yourself. And they're, they've raised over $120 million. Yeah. And they're looking to raise another $15 million, according to this announcement, that basically would force an entire recapitalization of the company, which means that... Um, Everybody who's invested up until now will just lose their entire stake. Right. I don't get that. Because, right? I mean, I'm reading the story here and it says the new deal essentially wipes out the stakes of pre-existing investors. I mean, what's going on? I don't understand that. Explain to me as... Because because the um, the valuation of the round, right? If they've raised $120 million, mm -hmm. let's just say that that buys, in general, you're diluting yourself at every investment round by 20%. Right, so that buys you twenty percent of the company, which would value the company. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm summarizing, but that would value the company what, whatever one hundred and twenty times five is, which is six hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. Right. So, if you then take another additional fifteen million dollars, but you take it at a valuation that's way lower than that right. six hundred million dollars, well, then the value of everybody's share just goes massively lower. Right, so, this, so is, this is bad news for all existing investors, right? This is terrible news for all existing investors. So, so here it says, Montreal's last round was $85 million, right? Which valued the company at, what does it say, 300? So what's 300 divided by 85? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's about, so 85 over 300, right? It's 28%. So even that was really large dilution. And now they're saying they're selling $15 million, Let's say that's for another thirty percent of the company. You just multiply it by three, so wow. it's like now valuing the company at forty-five or fifty million dollars. It's just terrible. Why would they get such a bad deal for that money? <clears throat> Couldn't they get some kind of credit line for that kind of amount? I mean, rather than go and give away thirty percent of the company for fifteen million. I think million. the answer, I think the answer to that is no. Right. Otherwise, they probably would have done that. I mean, Montre is a company that's very famous. And that every, you know, obviously everyone's heard of it. I'm just trying to remember who their existing investors are. But their existing investors were actually offered a, the ability to invest in this round again. Hmm. And most of them are investing. So now they're just, their original stake, they're just saying is gone or most of it's gone. Wow. And they're kind of re-upping. Right. And it looks like there's a convertible note on this but it looks like that convertible note has no cap on it but the point for this is that um it's just bad for that kind of business 
What, right. is it, what does it mean for the, the management team in future? I mean, let's say this doesn't work out. They go and start another venture. Are they going to have their cards marked or is it sort of, okay, right, that was history. Will they, will they have problems in the future trying to race? It really depends on where in the cycle the venture capital business is at the time that they're trying to raise. It also, I'm not familiar with both of these founders, but if you notice at the end of the article, it all, it does say that the, the founders, so Tritran hmm. and uh, Conrad Chu no longer work for the company. Oh, all right. <laughs> so either they've decided on their own that they wanted to leave or they've been asked yeah. politely to, um, Take their stuff, put it in a box, and walk out. <laughs> okay, escorted, escorted out the building by security. <laughs> I shouldn't be laughing, but it's just been that kind of week for me. <laughs> so, all right, was that a surprise up front? No, no, oh, we got no, more. There's a, much, there's a much better. That's just follow stick up. around for more. Yeah, yes, that's just follow up because we talked about food and food yeah. delivery and food tech last week, and I just think this is a bad. It's a bad omen for what could potentially happen out here. And and if you look at what Uber's doing in the Uber Eats space, and we talked about this last week, right? they have raised so much money and just have a massive valuation. And regardless of the sort of political or marketing problems that they're having for their staff and all those other issues, their technology in this particular space, because it's logistics, seems so far ahead of everybody else's. I just think it's going to be hard for other people to catch up. Yeah. Just my, just my, you know, innocent opinion on this. Yeah, I agree with you. I think there's a lot <laughs> going on in, behind the scenes with these stories as well. I, mean, I think so too. Yeah, I and mean, it will come out in time, obviously. I think so. What else are we talking about today, Michael? What's good? Well, I wanted to start with medical tourism, and I wanted to sort of make this the follow-on from what we what we discussed at the conference today. We started with medical tourism because it's a space that I know really well, but then moved into sort of the general space of health tech. And I kind of wanted to go through the types of things we spoke about today. So mm. medical tourism is a very interesting business. It's huge. And to a certain extent, Southeast Asia is right in the middle of it. And we can get to that in a second. But if you look at the businesses that are related to medical tourism directly just on the medical side, so eliminate the travel and the hotel and things like that, in Malaysia, Singapore, and the Philippines are all over a billion dollars, at least as of a year or so ago. And in Thailand alone, it's over $2 billion. So in those, what is that, four countries, it's about a $5 billion a year business. Yeah. And <clears throat> I like to think of these businesses, the, a medical departure business and a, the Ring MD business, which I'll get to in a second, um, not just as a product business, right? So it's not like an e-commerce business where they're selling a product, they're selling a platform. Right. And in most cases, it's a marketing engine for doctors, clinics, hospitals. And I like the fact that these are platform businesses mm. because you can run massive businesses and a bunch of verticals around them. Right. And <clears throat> to, to a certain extent, what both of these businesses have done is tried to find a different angle to take advantage of an arbitrage in the market, which is another space that I like quite a bit. So you're building a platform that has an arbitrage built in. Well, why is that? Well, if you're living in the United States or living in the Middle East, even if living in the United Arab Emirates, right, a very wealthy place with a whole bunch of wealthy people that need medical care, with good hospitals, to be fair, they look at the cost of procedure for, I don't know, pick a procedure, um, open heart surgery, or any sort of complex surgery, and they'll see, as an example, right, I don't know what the exact prices are, let's say it's a $45,000 procedure in the Middle East or in the United States. In Thailand, for that type of procedure, it could be fifteen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000. It literally could be one-third the price, and that's where the arbitrage is. And so we spent a lot of time talking about why <clears throat> in Thailand – those types of businesses exist and why they're and why the procedures here are so much cheaper. And one of the reasons why we can go back and talk about individual businesses in a second that do this across the world. But one of the reasons why the care is so good is that the medical practitioners in Thailand in particular 
super well educated here and then essentially sent to the United States by the hospitals or by the, you know, medical services providers, trained at great hospitals in the U.S. because it's fully paid for by the institutions here. Mm. And then they come home and they have to serve. It's almost like the ROTC program in the United States where the, it's called Reserve Officers Training Program in the United States where you they'll pay for your college, but after that you have to give them four or five years of reserve duty. And you end up with these super educated doctors who then come back, but because the cost base is here for building the hospital, the real estate, and just the salary is much lower for a hospital like Blumengrad, which even even being a, a private hospital, and like BNH, which is a Bangkok Nurses Hospital, <clears throat> excuse me, you have the opportunity to charge an arbitrage style price for that. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the numbers, the fundamentals are really good for this, aren't they? I mean, if you look at what, I mean, if you take just the, the US export market in terms of people going abroad for tourism, I'm just looking at the numbers here. 1.2 million Americans traveled abroad for medical care in 2014. 1 million, right? And that's just right. America. And here's another figure I'll throw into the mix. I mean, take America out of the equation. Look at somewhere just like Indonesia. You know, Indonesia in terms of Indonesians going to the rest of Southeast Asia for health care. And here's the numbers here I've got in front of me. $11 billion they spent, Indonesians, going abroad and primarily in Asia, Malaysia, Thailand. Correct. Correct. And that's, in, the that's Indonesians. That, right. <clears throat> right. So if you look at the U.S. numbers as well, right, you said a million people, if an average procedure for something sophisticated is $15,000, it's dollars 15, it's $15 billion. Right. So the market's massive. And the best thing about these types of platform businesses, right, is that not only are you getting paid to arrange medical care, but if you have to have outpatient care after your procedure, you need to stay in the country where that care was provided. Mm. And that means, first of all, you need to fly here from somewhere. So you may get an affiliate fee for from an airline. You can help them arrange hotels. <clears throat> you can have arrangements with the hospitals or with the clinics to help them arrange travel. But it also means that the local economy benefits from people eating out. So if you yeah. if you're if your wife comes with you or your husband comes with you, if you're coming here to get a procedure, and it can just be it can be a plastic surgery procedure if you go to Korea to do it. It can be a, an, some kind of enhancement if you come to Thailand. All these countries do have. Um, their own specialties. But that business ends up being quite big, as you mentioned with the Indonesian example and with the US example. Yeah. And people do go in couples, usually for these kind of treatments as well. I mean, I know somebody coming from Japan going to Thailand for dental treatment, him and his wife. So, you know, you would have thought, well, I know we talked about this before, but in Japan, you know, these countries should have their own advanced healthcare and dental systems, but they would go somewhere like Thailand because the cost of going to Thailand plus staying in Thailand and having a holiday, you know, they have a vacation in Thailand at the same time and getting their teeth done works out so much cheaper than literally going to their local dentist and getting it done. I think what you find is that if you build a hospital from scratch, it's probably likely that doing that is much less expensive and way more efficient than renovating a hospital in the United States or in Europe. And what that means is that you get to get the benefits of all of that, of all the cost savings, but also the efficiency savings. You get to put all the newest equipment, all the newest machinery, and because your doctors could potentially be younger and more recently trained, you have all the new right. procedures as well, which means that it's generally safer and it could be in a hospital where your doctors are older, using older procedures, older machinery, and older equipment. So every everybody benefits by by making that trip. The arbitrage works all the way around. Yeah, amazing. Here's some more figures for you, Michael. What do you think about this? The well, av- I mean, let's take a, a complicated procedure. I mean, let's take a, like for example a C-section. So obstet- okay. obstetrics in the U.S. A C-section yes. would cost. I'm just looking at the numbers here. On average, fifty thousand dollars in the U.S. An insurer may, a commercial insurer may pay out about thirty thousand dollars for that. Whereas, yeah. if you were to do that in Thailand, 
just having a look at the Bangkok Hospital as an example, and they publish their prices pretty upfront. Yes, and they're, they're very transparent about this. One hundred eight thousand Thai baht, which is just over three thousand dollars, right? <laughs> yes. So you could go to Thailand. I mean, you probably on a C-section, you probably wouldn't go there for that. But just in terms of the comparatives of a complicated surgery, right. whatever it was, you could go there, have a vacation with your family or whoever, and come back and be significantly in pocket. Yeah, I mean, you could have an incredible vacation as well, right? Incredible, and like you said, you'd have all that money saved. Yeah. It's pretty, and, and and that is just an, one example of a type of procedure that regular people would do that, again, is just so expensive in the United States hmm. and so reasonable here. It, it also begs the question, although we don't want to get into this, but it begs the question, why is it so expensive? Right. Right. I mean, in a way, it reminds me of the infrastructure problem we have in the United States, right? In other words, building a brand new bridge and renovating a bridge or a highway is just so inefficient and so yeah, expensive. Yeah, yeah. You know, from time and convenience. Whereas, you know, when the Chinese want to build a new high-speed railway, they just kind of drop it in because there was nothing there before. Yeah. Well, what about, I mean, I think as a consumer, if you're in the United States or Europe or even the Middle East, as you say, looking at Asia as an option, I think a lot of people, especially maybe an older generation, would be quite fearful of going to Asia because I'm sure the media feeds back, you know, a number of horror stories and amplifies them <laughs> unnecessarily, right? Probably. Uh, as, much, as much as they happen back home, right? But, you know, they, that tends to be just by the by. So, I mean, you know, in terms of the, I mean, you know, I know you said they can get better access to infrastructure and so on, but I guess kind of it's the, the personal service that people are going to be affected quite heavily by, isn't it? You know, if they go there and, you know, they, they don't get treated well. So what would the experience be like for a foreigner coming to Thailand to get some kind of medical procedure, would they get a good personal service? So the hospitals here have been very good at staffing, you know, their different departments with people that speak your language as well. So if you go to Bumrungrad Hospital, there are parts of it that are set up only for Japanese people. If you go to BNH, it's the same thing. I actually know somebody who works at one of the hospitals whose only job is to help people with their Japanese insurance. Wow. Yes, it's very, it's very well set up and very efficient. And it means that you can come with confidence because your friend has already come with confidence and then gone home and explained to you hmm. it's, it's similar, if not better than going to a hospital in Japan. Right. Yeah. So the service is set up in such a way that you feel very, very comfortable I went in, this was a few years ago now, but I, I went in to get something done. The doctor spoke perfect English, had been educated at Harvard Medical School, and it was just insanely incredible. It was really, really good. And even a few years ago, more than that, actually, I was in Bali and needed to literally run out of Bali because of a rash or something, came to Bumrungrad Hospital in Bangkok. The doctor prescribed the right medicine, went back to Bali, and everything was fine. And there was no way I was – I was living in Japan at the time and there was no way I was flying back to Tokyo for that because I never would have been able to continue my vacation. Hmm. So these are, the, these are some of the types of things that we discussed about today. Now, remember, because these are platform businesses as well, you're not talking about just a booking mechanism and setting up a relationship with a hospital, right? So because these businesses are platforms – there is a methodology out there to connect the platform with insurance companies. So filing your insurance claim is e easier. Having the hospitals connect and then connect via your platform to the pharmaceutical companies. So for them, ordering large amounts and efficient amounts of medicine is easier. There's a whole bunch of ways where these platforms can make money and eliminate middlemen, not just locally and regionally, but globally as well. So imagine if you are an insurance company, a payment system, a pharmaceutical company, or even like an HMO, <clears throat> you have ways where you can connect to this platform and now you've got a really robust business. And one of the things we talked about today was that medical care has been historically uniquely local. Right? You'll generally go to a hospital within 50 miles or a doctor within probably 15 miles of your home. 
right? But one of the things that Ring MD is trying to do in this region, and Doctor on Demand has started to do earlier, had started to do earlier in the United States, was create a 24/7 access ability to doctors via video. Hmm. Right. So for very simple questions, have a curated and a vetted group of doctors all over the world in multiple languages to be able to, you just dial them up over a video connection, whether it's on Skype or iChat or some type of mechanism like that and ask them questions and get, get, and get answers. And again, it's well cheaper than either going there. But it's also more efficient as well. And the doctors get paid. They get paid something like 20 to $40, I believe, an hour or for 15 minutes, whatever it is. Very, it's lucrative for everybody involved. Yeah, yeah. But the patients also love it too because let's, if you're experiencing some kind of discomfort but you know you don't need a procedure, maybe sometimes you don't want to leave your home. Mm-hmm. And maybe there's a certain level of embarrassment as well about – getting out of your house and actually sitting in a waiting room somewhere and having to discuss with complete strangers things you don't want to discuss with them. You don't want people to know why you're at the hospital. What's your take on this ring MD service, Michael? Cause I think we need to talk about the guy behind it as well. It's quite an interesting proposition, isn't it? It is. I mean, Justin seems, I mean, sorry. Yeah, I mean, Justin seems like a really interesting guy. The original story that was published about him was that, you know, he got funded as a 21-year-old, right? Um, And he took $500,000 from the government of Singapore, essentially, to go out and and fund and build this business. I, I wonder sometimes, though, one of the questions that I asked the venture capitalists today on the panel was, do you think people want face-to-face, like real human interaction, or you think they're comfortable doing this over video. And they both had, the two venture capitalists there, and even Paul had a very interesting answer to this question, right? So this kid is great, right? And then, you know, he started his first business when he was, I don't know, 10 years old. I can't remember who he was, but something silly, right? Started coding when he was seven, started his first business when he was 10, I mean, I love these kids, right? Because they they grow up in a world that that's not familiar to me. Um, and what they what they've built is, and what they've given the people the opportunity to do, like I said, is get this kind of twenty twenty four seven ability to talk to people. And he's essentially trying to go out and copy this business that we talked about in the United States called Doctor on Demand. But he's actually trying to do more, right? It seems to me, and I, I'm, I was disappointed that he wasn't on the panel today. He, he missed it. He was stuck doing something else, right? Which is too bad. I think everybody lost a little bit because he wasn't there. But he seems to have kind of a, a social responsibility bent to what he's doing as well, right? So if you look at the Ring MD business and you read like what they say about themselves, they really want to go out and help people by bringing healthcare online. I really want people that – because remember, if you have the ability to connect, and in a lot of countries, even if there are no doctors in your town, you probably have some internet connectivity via your mobile phone, right, particularly in this region. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to connect to sort of the medical infrastructure without being able, without having to go there. And I think he sounds really concerned about this part of the business, and that's great, right? And I think sometimes the younger you are, the more concerned you are about sort of the social aspect and the social responsibility aspect of this business. Mm. And I thought that was very interesting about this too. And he's trying to build a whole ecosystem around this. But one of the things that I posited today was if you look at the competition in this space, right, And if you look at kind of a list of who's participating in this business, right, whether it's Doctor on Demand, which is a business that's based in San Francisco, DocDoc, which, again, similar style of business to all of these, which is in Singapore, ZocDoc, which is trying to take documents and bring them online, which is based in New York and has raised a ton of money, Um, Medigo, which is a Europe-based business, Practo, which is a business based in India, India. And then Top Docs, which is also based in Singapore. It's incorporated in Singapore, but the reality is that the woman who runs the business, Cassandra, is based in Thailand. 
So there's a lot of competition in this space. I mean, that's just what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight businesses already that are trying to build a similar type of platform. They will intersect. And to be fair, and, and maybe this is my bias, right? But it seems to me like the Ring MD business is going to be something that's more of a feature of a business than a business in and of itself. An acquisition, maybe. Well, just a merger, right? Because if you think about just in this region, if you look at Top Docs, basically, um, Doc Doc, which is based in Singapore, and medical departures are essentially trying to do all the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. They're trying to put doctors and clinics online, and they're trying to give them a way to manage their schedules in a way that's more efficient, but also give kind of a trip advisor style mm-hmm. experience to people that want to find out not only am I, am I going to participate in medical tourism, but who's the best doctor because it's not in my country and it's not in my neighborhood. How do I find out who the best person is? So a lot of these services also allow you to rate the doctors as well, right? I don't want to get the conversation too ahead of itself at this moment, but I'm curious to know, do you think that what's kind of happening in medical tourism at the moment and this kind of reinvention of that experience for the, if I can say the consumer, who's the patient, like you're talking about these businesses like we've just talked about or the hospitals which are you know engineering themselves or designing themselves around this experience rather than saying right we're a hospital this is how we should be and do you think that that when that grows that could kind of almost like reverse engineer itself back into the healthcare system so i mean why couldn't we have healthcare tourism just for domestic healthcare so, for example, if I wanted to go to, I'm talking about, you know, years to come, rather than just rely on the traditional quote unquote system, I could use a healthcare, to, a medical tourism service to go and see a doctor locally here, right? You know, I could pick my doctor, I could, you know, get reviews of the doctor, those kind of things. So it's kind of like, you know, it's almost like, you know, what works out there may then filter back into the mainstream medical community. It's a really good question. And one of the things that we're finding, particularly with a service like Medical Departures, is when you turn it on in a particular country with the focus of bringing people in from outside, right? So pure tourists coming in to get medical procedures. What we're starting to find is that your middle class, and this was a question we addressed today at the conference as well, will then use that service internally Mm. for them to... to determine, sure, we've been using this doctor for two generations. You know, my mother went to this doctor's father, and I'll go to the son now to continue my medical care. But that next generation is now using the service to find out who maybe slightly outside their neighborhood is actually better at some tor- some type of dentistry or some type of medical procedure. So that's, we're already seeing that happening. It's a really good question, actually. And what about insurance companies? Would they then look at these services and says, well, actually, you know, are we going to pay out $30,000 for a, a procedure here? Or can we send these people to Thailand? <laughs> I mean, is that a possibility? It is a possibility. Again, another thing we addressed today, and that is that the insurance markets are really, really local, right? So the insurance industry in the United States, at least historically, has been based like in Hartford, Connecticut, which is strange in and of itself. Right. But most most insurance companies don't have global coverage unless you're traveling, right? That's why travel insurance itself still exists. Mm. So it'll be it'll be interesting to see how the insurance companies catch up with the globalization of the world, in the sense that they it may make sense at some point in time for them to actually recommend a trip. Yeah. But I can't see it happening soon because imagine a situation where you go to your insurance company and try yeah, to huh? try to get a pay a payout for you know a hotel in Bangkok and a flight to to Malaysia or whatever it is, even if it's half price. Big companies have really hard times with this because yeah, yeah. they built us. They built literally. They built a technology system that doesn't allow them anywhere to input that right. So you would think. That you would say, okay, overall, here is my procedure for, again, you know, I I don't know, let's just call it like breast enhancement or plastic surgery on your nose or or something, right? 
they have a place inside their system to enter that procedure. But even if it's a third the price, all-inclusive, they probably don't have a way to enter flight, yeah, hotel, yeah. and dinner, right. even if it's much less expensive. There's a lot of moving parts there, isn't there, which is sort of out of their scope of competence, right. isn't it? Exactly, and that's why we that's why we talked today about how what is the right incentive for building a long term relationship for these platforms with the insurance companies, the pharmaceutical companies as well, and the payment companies, so that those types of systems can then get built. There's a place to actually input travel mm -hmm. into your medical care because in almost all cases, particularly in the Western world, the travel actually makes it cheaper to get the procedures you mentioned earlier. Right, so it would make sense for someone to want to to want to give somebody an incentive to travel to another country to get super high medical care, mm. even even if it even if that travel is to Mexico from the United States, to get the same level or better medical care for a lower price. Mm. And the great thing for me about arbitrage, again, coming out of a trading and finance background, is is that. The the discovery of an arbitrage in almost all cases leads to its disappearance, if that makes sense. Yeah. Right. Do you understand what that means, right? In other words, if there's an arbitrage out there, people will do it and do it and do it until that arbitrage starts to collapse, and it collapses in two ways: either a, the product that's the new product becomes more expensive as the people that have developed this new product determine that they can charge more for it. Or the old product becomes less expensive as the old product providers determine that there's somebody out there actually can do this at a lower price. But I think what ends up happening really is a combination of those things and a new market price gets set that's probably somewhere closer to the middle. Right. That, that's what I mean when I say that if, if once people determine that there's an arbitrage, that arbitrage generally disappears. Well, with something like a, a geographic arbitrage, Mm -hmm. that arbitrage is going to be around for a long, long time, isn't it? Because you're still going to have people, you know, in these countries, salaries, a, a snip of what, you know, a doctor would be earning in the US, right? I mean, that's not going to change for a long time, is it? And you're still not going to get people readily upping and going to Thailand for their procedures, right? So that arbitrage is going to be around for, I mean, it's not going to be wiped out, is it? We're not going to start seeing them charging what we would pay, you know, a hospital in Thailand charging what a hospital in the US is going to be charging anytime soon. So there's still going to be huge opportunities, I think, for a long time. Probably. Probably. One of the other things we discussed today was how to, because the tech we've talked about up until now that you and I have discussed up until now is really software, pure software, right? How to use a software platform to take advantage of an arbitrage from a travel and a procedure perspective, right, in a, in a very simplistic form. But one of the things that was mentioned, and, and, and Paul chimed in as we kind of got to the end of this discussion, and I'll get to him in a second, but one of the things that both of the venture capitalists mentioned were, you know, how does artificial intelligence mm. and, and we a wearable medical device fit into this procedure? So, I mean, fit into this um, infrastructure. So what does that really mean? Well, from an artificial intelligence standpoint, it's very straightforward, right? You give all this information to a doctor today, and you're, the doctor will take a look at it. He'll try, he or she will try to figure out what all that information means, um, and then they'll make a diagnosis. Where this is pure diagnostic medicine. Predictive medicine should be a little bit better, which we can get to in a, sec to, in a second, right? But let's say you have a pacemaker. And that pacemaker is obviously connected to your heart. But that pacemaker also has a way to send data remotely after it's installed into a doctor in another country. So now you've, you have a little bit of medical tourism because you have to travel there to get the whole procedure done. But after that, the monitoring process can literally be done 24 hours a day, seven days a week by generating all this data for your doctor who is no longer in your country or in your neighborhood. And it allows you then to send that data, maybe not instantaneously, but in relatively real time, for your doctor or your doctor's team to continuously monitor that information. And the more information that gets collected, 
the more big data that gets collected, right? And then the more artificial intelligence that can be applied to that data in almost an algorithmic way mm. to then determine what type of um, service or medicine or just follow-up you would need based on the entire globe's medical data and history that, that goes with that. And also remember, here's where it gets really interesting to me, is that if you have a wearable device and all that information on that device is anonymized, let's say, right? So you wear something, whether it's a ring or a heart monitor or something, that data then gets saved for your entire life. So if you're 20 years old and you wear one of these devices when you're 50 and you have a heart attack, the doctor actually has 30 years of data on your heart. Yeah. Just think about that. And now you're, you may be perfectly healthy, but everybody else that's your age, born in the same time, had the same job, has the same kind of health profile as you, now gets to benefit from that type of health tech. This is where it's way bigger than the types of things that are getting developed today. And I think, as you said, we're a little bit ahead of ourselves with this conversation, but the, the medical profession is moving in that direction. And, yeah. one of the, and one of the things that Haley said today, which I thought was really interesting, is that a normal doctor is tired of dealing with somebody who comes in with bronchitis because it's standard. And I, I'm trying to remember the exact words that she used, but she said it's like the least common dom- denominator way to use their degree. Hmm. And so if they're dealing with something that has to do with bronchial, right, whether it's the lungs or the throat or the, all these things, they'd rather do something highly complicated and super sophisticated from a procedural standpoint because it's just frankly more intellectually interesting to them, right? Hmm. But – the way it's structured now is that they don't they have to see all those other patients. So if there's a way to automate that process using artificial intelligence, using wearables, and then connecting all of that data together, she thought that was yeah. a potentially great business model. But also great for healthcare as well. So those things dovetail really nicely together, right? Huge money saver. If you well, can get, you know, it's eighty twenty, isn't it? That you could take away eighty percent of all those cases which could be dealt with. You know, before they even went to the hospital or the doctor's surgery, right? Right. And this is where I thought Haley added so much value to today's conversation because all of the consulting work she did, I said to her, can you explain to me how, you know, what did you study when you were in undergraduate school? Was it when you were an undergrad? I said, did you, were you interested in healthcare from the beginning? She said, I wasn't disinterested in it, but it wasn't my focus. I got a basic Wharton education in finance and economics. And when I graduated, I believe, and I'm, I'm just doing this from memory, but I believe it was around 2009 or 2010, and this was when ACA was getting passed in the United States. So the the um, the, the Obamacare, yeah, the Affordable Care Act, and she said at that time because a lot of the things in the system were changing, a lot of the consulting gigs that they were giving out at the time were related to healthcare, and she said it was so fascinating to see the way people. We're dealing with how to do this and how to make money and all these other things. She said she just got really into it and she's continued to do it. And like I said earlier, her ability to discuss these things and also give deep, deeper insights into it, I thought was really impressive. Mm, for sure. Right. So, yeah. So a lot of the talk around this was around that. But what was even more interesting, right? And Paul, like I said, who runs medical departures, slightly out of self interest, maybe. But also because he really believes this, a little bit of this AI stuff and the wearable stuff is like so far into the future, right? Which is something you mentioned earlier that his belief is that we're not there yet. We're not close to being there yet. And before any of that gets solved, the, um, the fragmentation in the medical market has to get solved first. Yeah. Right. We're coming at different angles though, aren't we? I mean, that completely, I mean, that's a huge problem as it stands, but you've got this other thing, this technology side coming in, which is really from the grassroots, isn't it? You know, you've got this, what the the whole wearable thing is just so exciting because in a way, you know, the whole thing would take a generation to work if it required the medical community to go and install devices on every single patient out there. But what's kind of happening is it's like, you know, people now, I'm just sitting here with my Garmin 
wearable on you know and people consumers are buying these things now and they have the function whether it's you know an apple phone or an apple watch or or whatever you know people have that function now installed on them right right that's and and they're doing it they're actually actively measuring themselves quantifying themselves right right and they're doing without anybody asking them exactly and sharing it so the technology's there, right? Sure. You know, if I want to share with you my heart rate for the last 24 hours, you know, I'm happy to do that. I'm sure you're not interested in it, but it's there, right? That's the exciting you, thing that, you know, you know, yeah. that is there ready. We don't have to then reinvent or invent a whole market, do we? No, we don't. And that was the point I was trying to make earlier is that the ability to accumulate this data is already there. But for someone like I am, I'm 51 years old. I'm not going to get a lifetime's worth of data, but my daughter could potentially have that. Yeah. Right? And there are so many other things you could monitor. For instance, if you are living, you know, in a place where there's ambient radiation, right? There are plenty of places like in Ireland and such where the radiation that's coming out of the ground just naturally is. You can measure that and then determine cancer rates, whether they're related. You know, there can be a correlation whether it's a causality or not. It's a different story, but you can measure correlation as well, which is much harder to do now because you can't measure at the same time that you're measuring the sort of the cancer treatments. It's it's just the the combination of all that data, again, applied with AI applied to it is just going to be huge, I think. Michael, do you see a time in the future where you get a phone call from your insurance company and they say, "Uh, Mr. Waits, we've been monitoring your your heart beat for the last X number of months or years. We've noticed some, you know, irregular patterns. We've got a flight book for you to, you know, down in the Bangkok hospital, leaving on, you know, next Monday. How about it? Is that, you know, in that sort of a bit Star Trek, but at the same time, it's joining all the dots, isn't it? I mean, that would be an amazing outcome, wouldn't it? It's kind of like you take, you need somebody like a, a Travis Kalanick and Uber to kind of pull all that together, right? You could just say, what if? Right. I mean, we can either look at this as an Orwellian dystopian future, or we can look at it as, you know, the preservation of a more comfortable life for everybody. And and I think the world is moving to a place where at the margin, right, people are less worried about privacy than they are about health and service. So I don't think that that's too far away from happening. And if you look at some of the big companies in the world, they're encouraging people so much actually to wear devices like an Apple watch, just as an example, that they're giving them away for free because insurance companies have told them that it'll lower their premiums to do that. Mm. Right. So in that respect, I don't think that's really far off at all. And I don't think it would surprise anybody if they did get a phone call not necessarily from their doctor, but from an insurance company that said to them, we need you to get on a plane, go right now and take care of this procedure. And I think people would, would do it. And I think people would do it happily, actually. Hmm. So, yeah. That, I don't that's think, save I don't the think insurance that's going to money. Huge. I mean, if they, could, if they could prevent a health condition occurring, right? You know, a right. serious one, right? I mean, that's, that's so the this way- is- yeah, this is the way that all of medicine is moving right now, right? Is their ability to say, um, how can we prevent things from happening? And there's a lot of technology that we haven't even discussed yet today, hmm. but that we can discuss about how people are using data, people are studying the human genome, and a whole bunch of other approaches to trying to determine how to prevent diseases from happening. And to extend life. And there's a, there's a whole amount of, there's a whole business around life extension mm. as opposed to disease prevention. Yeah. And we, we could spend hours talking about that as well. Well, there's a book published this year. I can't remember the name of the author, but it's called The Hundred Year Life. Fair enough. And it's, I think the data now is that if you're born in 2017, you have <laughs> 50% or more. So you're more likely than not to live to 100. Really? Yeah, that's the data now. So I mean, that's fascinating. If right? you're born now, you're going to live on average to 2117. I mean, it's just crazy, really. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's part of me that thinks like you can live too long. Right. <laughs> some people do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. But you know what I mean. I mean, at some level. So my my um 
my mother's mother is 101 years old. Wow. And, you know, she's healthy enough to be healthy, really. Like, she's not running around, like, working at Morgan Stanley, mm -hmm. but she's not close to dying either. So I do find this whole thing really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, especially living here in Japan. I mean, you just notice walking around how many old people there are. I mean, it's amazing, especially when you get out of the city. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Exactly. But Japan's unique. I mean, we can go off on a tangent for this. Like, there are probably women in their 80s and 90s that are still out planting. Um, right, right. Crop, right. Yeah, yeah. But that I'm opens up a whole, yeah. you know, that's a whole market for, just beyond the sort of the disease area, I mean, the sort of like the degenerative diseases, the, the mental aspect of aging as well. I mean, that yeah. alone, you talk about all the kind of conditions there. I mean, how expensive they are to look after, right? You know, if you had like a debilitating condition like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or something like that, you know, and that that is, you know, these are these are modern diseases effectively because people are, like, you know, like you say, they're kind of outliving what we were expected to live, right? Right. I mean, Jeff was telling us today that one of the things that a pacemaker does is it actually sends waves or electricity into the brain and one of the results of that is that it helps disintermediate or can help disintermediate parkinson's disease and i'm only mentioning it because you just did but again another approach to health and medical technology that people don't think about because they don't even know that it's a possibility but what's happening in that space hmm. again just because of our ability to analyze data and understand the human body in real time is just amazing yeah yeah, and I don't think it's going to end soon, obviously, but it's just going to get more and more advanced. I worry. Did you see? There was a story going around, and again, I'll have to confirm whether this is actually true or not, because you don't know now whether news is true or it's fake. But there's a doctor, I believe, in Italy who's trying to replace a human head for the first time. <laughs> it had to be that? somewhere like Italy, right? Right. I've seen that. I've seen, yeah. I don't know what the story is, but I've seen the headlines. Right. Anyway, I think that's a, that's probably a conversation for another day. <laughs> but it just seems to me that things are getting so advanced and we'll continue to do that. And I think all these things are accelerating. Hmm. Um, but just to get back to what we were talking about today, like the, the health tech and the med tech stuff was really fascinating. Hmm. And just and putting I, that into the context of Asia as well just makes it so much more exciting, right? Absolutely. Because again, it's all greenfield. This is the best thing about being here, right? Is that whether it's a device, a platform, a hospital, a procedure, all of these things are accelerating here. Mm. And, <clears throat> you know, we talked about this, I think, a few episodes ago, but we always say that the Japanese got rich before they got old. And that's one of the reasons why, as a country, right? That's one of the reasons why the country is going to have great medical care and interesting things will happen there and people will, will live longer than they might in other countries. Um, but China, because they got old before they got rich, and even they are getting rich, but they got older before they got richer, there's going to be a big necessity for them. And Chinese tourists are one of the leaders in medical tourism in this region. Oh, yeah. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how that gets disintermediated as well. Well, I saw that the uh, there's a piece of news out earlier this month that is it Hainan, the island in China, mm -hmm. they want to, the governor wants to make Hainan a global hub of medical tourism can do right i mean it's just that attitude isn't it like we're just going to build this thing i mean they do have a base already for chinese domestic medical tourists right mm. but just that attitude in asia right okay well you know it's greenfield we're not playing from a legacy we don't have the kind of restrictions that we may have in other countries let's just build it yeah why not why not anyway we could go on and on about um medical technology and health technology, but I wanted to kind of wrap up with what we've already discussed. And then I wanted to get to your favorite part of our surprise. <laughs> What's the surprise. Well, you, you gave us a surprise up the top of the show. So I don't know if you've sort of, you've stolen the thunder from your second surprise. So the expectations are high. This is going to be like a recurring thing for me, but CB insights every year publishes their top hundred venture capitalists globally. Right. So if it was just in the United States, it would be less interesting to me because I just think because we exist in Southeast Asia, we exist in Asia. It's more interesting to me to see who, because you can invest anywhere in the world. And I always like to 
separate self promotion from success. And this is a, this falls into my category of that's a big surprise. Like it's not really a big surprise because it's slightly sarcastic. But if you go and look at the top 20, and I actually looked through the top two, the top 100 for 2015 as well. So the list that was published at the beginning of 2016 for CB Insights, and it was very similar. But if you look at the top 20, I just want to make sure that I'm looking at the list properly. I sort it in alphabetical order just because it's easy. But, you know, you have your standard usual suspects, right? Anderson Horowitz has one person in the top 20. Um, Benchmark Capital has three. Lightspeed Ventures has two. Sequoia Capital has three, one of whom is based in China. But again, it's the same companies. And, you know, Benchmark is probably my favorite VC because of the way they run their business. It's lean. It's a real partnership in the sense that they don't have new people coming in all the time. And there are really only five of them. And they don't run a gigantic fund. I think their most recent fund was $500 million. And that's kind of the, the, the size they like. But, the, you you know, look. Lost from that list or conspicuously absent from that list is the biggest promoter of themselves and, you know, maybe my least favorite venture capitalist, and that is the guys that call themselves 500 strong. Um, they were nowhere to be found in the top, top 100 either this year or last year and definitely not in the top 20. And again, it falls into the category of that's not a big surprise. And the, the, the way CB Insights goes and measures it is it's not weighted by fund size necessarily, although you do have to have a certain amount of size to get there. Um, but it's really weighted by performance and exits that you had over the past year. So being able to take money and give it back to your investors or just monetize some of the things that you've done really well. And a lot of the VCs were in Twitter and a couple of, was it Twitter? I can't remember, but a few of these companies that, um, that had gone public. So Snapchat obviously was a big contributor to success in the last year. It was just interesting to see that the people that are the quietest, whether it's Kleiner Perkins or Greylock or, you know, the Benchmark team or the Battery Ventures team or Sequoia Capital, even Lowercase Capital, which is run by Chris Zaka, who, again, is a big talker but rarely talks about his investments and the success of them, but is more likely to talk about how to build a successful company and has spent a lot of time helping other countries. He's not very self-promotional, but the self-promoters were nowhere to be found on this list, and that, that falls into my category of that's not a big surprise. That's great. Mike, does that tie into what we talked about the other week when we talked about demo days? Is there some correlation between the amount of <laughs> demo days a, a VC fund does and its appearance on this list? Inverse correlation. Yeah, there, there may be. Look, the Y Combinator guys do a really good job of not making a lot of noise necessarily unless it's around one of their portfolio companies that's trying to do something new or different. Uh, I, I don't necessarily agree with their business model. And, you know, a guy that I like and respect a lot, um, Jason Calcanis, does run a launch festival. But he he'll does it he does it differently, too, and I, I like his approach. And he was talking about this yesterday on the Recode media platform, and that was in the old days, and even today, you have some of these big um, conferences that will actually charge the startups to present and to be on stage. And his idea was to make it as inexpensive as possible, if not free, for them to participate because he'd rather have them take that money and build their business mm. rather than get duped into participating in a conference. And that, those are his words, not mine. So there is some of that, I think, right? Um, but companies like Benchmark are not running demo days. And to, to, from my knowledge, they're definitely not participating in these demo days because that's not the way they make their investment decisions. Right. But again – not a big surprise that the people that are out – remember, I don't have a problem um, structurally or th or philosophically about going out and <clears throat> saying that the companies in which you invested were, were great. But it's kind of a little bit grating to go out and say, you're really great. Yeah. It's a different metric for me, and it's just an annoyance. But, yeah, it's not a big surprise huh. that huh. They're, not on, they're not among the top investors. Um, and they will say this, and we'll we'll address this as we as we go forward. They'll say they're the most prolific investors, or the most active investors. But that doesn't mean anything for your limited partners who don't care how active you are; they just care how much money you return to them right. on an IRR basis. So that's that. Annoyance. I like the way you use that word. <laughs> Pulling punches uh, today. A little bit. Yeah. 
That's cool. It. Well, they, I mean, they do, they do get a regular feature on this show, 500. They do, don't they? <laughs> and the other guys as well. We won't mention them because they haven't been no. in the new this week. They were, well, we'll give them a break this week, but they'll be back next week, I'm sure. I'm sure they will. Um, yeah, I had a really interesting conversation. I'll, I'll, I want to tie this up, right? But I had a really interesting conversation on a topic that we discussed a few weeks ago about um, real investments and fake investments. And I learned a little bit more, which maybe we'll cover next week, about um, – how somebody who's not a venture capitalist and not really an investor invested, and I put that in quotes, in a company, and how they made their return. So I learned a little bit today, and it was in a public conversation, so I think I feel free to talk about it. We can talk about it next week about the game company here that invested in the game company oh, in, that one. in Brazil. Yeah. But um, it was interesting. So, and again, it was a little bit of an arbitrage bet there, but we can talk, we'll talk about that next week. Yeah, yeah I look forward to that. Yep. So again, thank you so much for everything. Just yeah, for everything. <laughs> today was today was awesome as usual. If you want to contact either one of us, you can go directly to the Asia Tech Podcast website and sign in there. You can follow our stuff on YouTube and subscribe there, and on iTunes as well. ITunes. You can hashtag us Asia Tech Podcast on Twitter, and you can direct message me. Uh, on at Michael Waits on Twitter as well. You can find me on Facebook probably too if you feel like messaging me there. I've seen a lot of people contacting me recently on Twitter and also on LinkedIn to yeah. see all the stuff and listen to all the stuff that we're doing. So we're everywhere. You can get all of us. And we'll put the details in the show notes as well. Please. AsiaTechPodcast.com. Michael, Thank it's been you. great talking to you. Great subject. Awesome. Loved it. Yeah. Thanks, man. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.